to you just about 19 minutes after the hour of 7 o'clock. I am Natalie Legor, and we're going to be speaking with Dan Haddad from the T Tobago Chamber of Commerce just to find out how the chamber feels about the government's proposal to extend the state of emergency by three months. Good morning to you, Ms. Haddad. Good morning to you, Natalie, and all on set with you. Good morning to your viewers, and good morning to Trinidad and Tobago. Thank nice you. Nice to be here with you. I saw an empty chair, so I thought maybe it's my chair that's waiting for me to come there. <laughs> Actually, it is. It is. But, you know, because we want to ensure that all of us are safe, you know, you'll do it from Tobago for now, just for now. <laughs> so, but at least, you know, your chair is here, right? <laughs> So, but, and, and talking about safety, let us just segue right into it. If this extension of the SOE is not also a way to try to ensure that we stay safe. Because for me, from where I am sitting, Dan, I think it's always a balancing act of, okay, so we have a certain amount of COVID positive uh, numbers. We have trying to reopen the economy and just to ensure that we don't upset the balance too much while we try to achieve our goals? Well, Natalie, it's not about, I think we have been balancing for the longest while. Unfortunately, the scale of finance is a total disaster. And there's the other part of the scale of the human element, that whole um, interaction, that communication, that whole element is now under threat. I mean, I have spoken to a number of persons who I was stunned and, and I mean, decent people who have decent homes, who have supportive homes, and their children have collapsed on them or cracked on them and did not do exams and, and were not into the classes, although they were registering. So from that perspective, we are seeing that people are starting to crumble or crack. We need to address it. That's, that's part A. Um, part B is human beings were not meant to live this way. Um, part B is we are in a position where the finance, as I just said, has overbalanced everything else and that scale has, has, has tipped over. That's not working anymore. And from the science aspect of it, um, we cannot say that we have seen that the locking down and the, the hours are making a change to the rise in cases or the drop in cases. We have had quite a time anyway for the last number of months. Um, Therefore, for me, it's more like applying common sense because at some stage, I, I look at how Scarborough, now Scarborough and Tobigonians are very, I want to say obedient to some degree. They are quite very much, remember, a lot of the population is CHA employed. So a number of them are home. They are being paid and they're pretty obedient when coming to that. So they are really staying home. They are not out on the road. We are not seeing anything in a, a major way breaking any rules in the night. Nine o'clock is impractical for the port and for how we operate as the business community because the boat gets in on some nights after nine. So we, we are legally breaking curfew every night. Our staff are on the road and they are still in some type of, you know, whether the police will stop me and the police will harass me going home, although some have passes. Passes have not been given out at that level in order for them to really move around freely in the night. And then we don't want them to abuse the passes either for when they are not working on the night that they have a pass for. So right. all of those factors come down to what is, and then we are locked off. Our flights and our boat capacity doesn't really accommodate very much taking place on the island. So how does it affect us really and truly? Um, Financially is where the blow is because people are just staying home and the place is quiet and, and to some degree dead. Remember, we depend heavily on the Trinidad market and then we depend on whatever tourism we would have gotten. I can't say enjoyed because that died a long time ago, international tourism. And so we, we are really in a sad place. We are so, so in other still. words, the chamber does not support the extension to the state of emergency. I don't know that it's making common sense at this stage. Churches are closed. Beaches are closed. Rivers are closed. Your vacation, your spare time, you're, you're using the beach. I mean, and, and, and let's go to this. Eh? And, and people have called in to us. People have, have expressed, listen, 
But normally when we have the flu or we are not well, they tell you go and take a good sea bath and you, and you get better. Why are we being blocked from the beaches? Tobago is a lot of communities you have in terms of church. And it's like, why are we being stopped from um, communicating prayerfully in, in, in our space? So you have a lot of those questions being asked. And so that actually stymies everything else. So yeah, no, how much more Diana, of this do we need? Diana, one of the arguments that the government has put forward is that, and I, Mark Edgehill, we had him on earlier this morning, and he spoke to it as well, is that unless the government is going to go to Parliament and change a lot of pieces of legislation to continue mass, mass vaccination, is that, under the state of emergency, it allows them to continue with the vaccination drive. So if we remove the state of emergency and have the curfews, as some people are suggesting, it doesn't deal with the vaccines that we, we keep insisting is the way out of this pandemic. Well, I have to tell you, I don't know is we keep insisting on that because that's not, and that's my personal position, that's not my position that the vaccine is the answer. So let, let me state that. The chamber's position is one where we have a split there and you have some members that don't believe that that's the answer. And there are other members who are on it. We have supported them in terms of um, getting the vaccination conversation going. But um, Tobago is a different society. So you notice that the hesitancy rate is very high there, much higher than right. Trinidad. So let us look at Tobago then in context. So we have a very low vaccination uptake as of now i think it was just 15 to maybe by 18 percent by now in terms of first jabs for vaccination we're saying and we don't want the state of emergency because we're saying we don't really see the practicality in it at this time but we do have an uptick in cases of a covid 19 in tobago so then how is that going to work in terms of looking at the economic outlook for Tobago and getting that economy going? Natalie, I have to tell you, <laughs> at this stage, I think we should accept that COVID is here. COVID is another flu virus. And we need the things about COVID that I spoke about since 2020 is that there's a message of cleanliness. What I have not noticed is the country taking a, a, a drive so getting people to remove all unnecessary old appliances from on the roadside and whether their properties are being maintained and cleaned properly to make sure we have no bacteria and fungus and viruses living around us. I have not seen that part of the drive at all. Yet we're telling people, sanitize your hands all day, wash your hands all day. But if I wash my hands all day, but um, my environment is dirty and around me, the bacteria and the fungus and the virus are still going to live and multiply. So I think, I don't know that we are approaching this in terms of, have we gone on a national drive for cleanliness to get our homes, our business places, our properties in order, the, the, the open spaces. Instead, they are all overgrown. They are not being maintained. And so we are multiplying and leaving space for a lot of other things to multiply from a, a health perspective. But so, and we are in the rainy season. I don't know that we're doing ourselves very much good. But in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic, though, have we proven that there's a correlation between the COVID-19 and, you know, whether grass is overgrown or we have, you know, stuff well, on the road that we need to move? While I understand that these, to me, eyesores definitely need to be out of the they, way they are and definitely not just need eyesores, Natalie. that they are not just eyesores. no as i said they, i agree they that are they not are just eyesores. Eyesores. i'm not saying that they're just eyesores for me they are an eyesore but i also know that they can cause a lot of other hazards and stuff but i'm saying have we proven that when it comes on to the covid 19 pandemic that this has somehow in any way driven the covid 19 pandemic well, at the beginning, it was one story, clean, 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 and then the other story was it's airborne. Now, if something is now also airborne, then we need to understand that we need to enjoy more open air, more external spaces. We need not be confined. I want to assume and imagine that air-conditioned spaces will not be as healthy because we are all in locked spaces, breathing the same rotating air. 
So I, I need to, to get the, somewhere in there. I, I, there seems to be a science miss for me in terms of how are we treating with the bigger picture. But, you know, there are aspects of it. I heard recently that once we are, don't have it under control, we continue to enjoy international funding of some sort. I don't know who that is. Nobody has said it publicly or politically to us. So, but, but these are the things you hear. Then we need to understand, is school opening come September 6th? Um, many people speak, but you know, school is opening by what they say, but there's nothing showing that school is opening in terms of maintenance of the compounds and getting them ready. Is school opening or not? Are we bringing these children out of this fair factor that we have buried them in? And the vaccine drive doesn't seem to be a vaccine drive more than it is we are locking you down and punishing you until you take this vaccine. So we need to be clear about what's the message we are sending because I'll tell you why. I have a fellow colleague in the chamber and quite um, expressive about vaccination drive and whatever very much pushing it and i am as an employee i can't tell you i am i'll be lying i have worked with my staff through this in many different aspects however i had a meeting last week and i asked my staff tell me who's vaccinated who's not when i told him the number of staff that i had vaccinated he said but wait you're doing better than me i said maybe your approach of trying to push it on people is making it out to be suspicious. And so it starts to make a conspiracy theory that's all over the internet that they participate in very highly. They are out there reading these things and listening. So by the time you are pushing it, pushing it, you start to make people think, wait, you're part of this too. So because of that, you get the fear factor running higher than the others. And I'm saying just maybe our approach is not working anymore and we need to change gear and direction of this how should we approach it at least how should the government approach the whole idea of mm -hmm. managing the pandemic managing the economy lives and livelihoods all right let me say that first to begin with in telling people that they're going to die from march last year to now and only having them in fear was the wrong approach i have been debating that on every interview and saying you are not going down the right road the only thing that overpowers fear is hope. And therefore, if you are not prepared now, let me see the same people stand up after I'm telling you, you're going to die, you're going to die, you're going to die. Let me stand up now and boost you and tell you, come out here, you need to live and put that hope in. I'm sorry, the messenger is not going to be the same person to carry that message because it's not going to sound well with anybody. It's not going to re re um, resound in any way to their vibrations in terms of how they, they think, because you have already buried them into a death formula. So then who is going to that carry that when, message? Well, they down. are the ones that created that, who, Natalie, to be who honest Who is going to carry you? that message? If you believe that the Minister of Health can't carry the message because, you know, they spoke about, you know, if you don't get vaccinated or with this COVID, if you catch it, you can die. Who is going to carry that message of hope? Well, Natalie... I'm going to tell you this, and this may sound blunt and may sound horrible. They carry the message. They need to answer me now. How would they be fixing that? Not me telling them, because maybe if we were consulted a bit earlier and the conversations were different, maybe we may have come out with a, a formula that gave us a middle line to work with this and not have us, because the private sector was um, also punished and put into a, a coffin for the last 18 months. So I'm not sure that the private sector at this stage is very energized to come out there and tell people, come out and work in a bounce. You know, let's, let's take Super Blues bounce, bounce, bounce now. I don't even know if Carnival is going to rebound this economy in terms of energy. I don't even think people have the zeal to go and play mass. We have killed a lot of it. We need to understand what we've done. But I don't know that I'm prepared to answer that question this morning. All right, Dan, we are out of time. But I want to thank you so much for sharing with us this morning. And I hope that we do get that message of hope because as a population, I think we all need it. But thank you. You're most welcome. Dan Haddad, their uh, chairman of the Tobago Chamber of the Trinidad and Tobago Chamber of Industry and Commerce, talking to us.